Next up is Joshua Randall. Joshua has over 15 years of experience at Chip Chats, which is weird because we've only done it for like the sixth one. Uh, 15 years of experience as a business analyst in a variety of industries. He currently works in the e-commerce department, and today he's going to talk to us about ubiquitous language. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, everyone, for being here. So, indeed, I am going to dabble you with a vocabulary word that's in the title of my talk, and what does it mean? You see the definition up there? Um, I like this word because it means something that is pervasive and something that is universal. Now, ubiquitous language is what we're actually interested in, and that's a concept in the world of software development. Um, to the best of my knowledge, this originated with a book called Domain Driven Design from 2003. And it essentially means that the business domain experts and the software engineers use the same terminology to facilitate their conversations and knowledge transfer. You can see another quote on the board from a book called The Art of Agile Development by James Shore and Shane Warden. Um, those two guys, along with Martin Fowler, I think are the ones who really popularized ubiquitous language in the years since. Um, Fowler gives us another definition. He says, it's a common rigorous language between developers and users. We need our language to be common so we can have clear communication. And we need our language to be rigorous because code does not deal well with ambiguity. So we would like to have a language that we can share and that can be reflected everywhere that we talk about whatever the the topic or the domain is that we're discussing in the user interface, in the documentation, in the code itself, in your methods, in your variables, in your classes, in your verbal conversations. Let me give you a few examples. Um, but before I do that, let me give you a side note, which is that this book, The Art of Agile Development, is exceptional, and I highly recommend it. You should all buy a copy. All right, on to the actual example. Um, James Shore in his book gives an example of music and setting, typesetting musical scores. So imagine you worked for a publishing house and they're gonna send you an XML spec and your job is to typeset it. Now this is difficult and seemingly minor differences in how you set something could be vitally important to the performers or in this case the singer singing Ave Maria. You could focus your design on the XML elements. You could ignore the concept of ubiquitous language. You could talk about parents and children and attributes. You could talk about device context and bitmaps and glyphs. And if you did that, you might have a conversation that sounded a little bit like this. You might say, we were wondering how we should render this clef element. For example, if the element's first child is G and the second child is two, but the octave change element is negative one, what glyph should we use? You're gonna get blank stares, much like the blank stares in this room, because nobody, including the business experts in the domain of music, will have any idea what you're talking about. But what if you used a domain-centric design or a ubiquitous language-driven design where you actually used the language of your users and of your musicians, where you talked about scores and measures and staffs and notes and treble clefs and bass clefs? Then you could ask a question like this. We were wondering how we should print this G clef. It's on the second line of the staff, but it's one octave lower. Is that a treble clef? And in that case, your business domain expert would know the answer, and he or she would be able to say, oh, that's often used for tenor parts in choral music. It is a treble clef, but it's an octave lower, so we put this little special symbol on it to show that. People on the phone, I'm pointing at the top treble clef on this staff here. And now you're having a conversation that actually leads you somewhere interesting and potentially prevents you from making a critical bug in how you typeset this music. Okay, that's a little abstract. Let's talk about something you know, more dear and dear, near and dear to our hearts, which is money. This thing that's in yellow on the lower left of your check, you've probably had to type this in on a website if you've ever set up online banking or you've paid a bill online. The question is, what is it and what do we call it? Well, I used to work in the banking system, and believe it or not, when we looked at our UI and our documentation and our code, there was really no ubiquitous language about what to call this thing. 
there were old names, there were new names, there were abbreviations, there were different abbreviations, there was some entirely different domain being brought in and sort of conflated with this, and it led to a huge amount of confusion. Especially when we got new people joining the company and we wanted to explain what is a pretty critical concept to the banking system. Because what this number is actually known as is a routing transit number. And you can tell by its name that it is critical to moving money around. It is definitely not a micro number. That's not even a thing. And, it, and it's not the micro line either. That's the entire line of magnetic ink on the bottom of the check. So if we can't even agree on what terminology to use in our code and in our documentation, how can we possibly get it right? Final example, Sherwin-Williams example. These are containers of paint. The one on the top is smaller than the one on the bottom. So we might call the one, right, obvious, but what do we call them? Well, maybe we call the one on the top a gallon or a single and the one on the bottom a five or a pail. Or maybe we call them a 16 and a 20 if we want to use the size code. So what, what should your ubiquitous language be in this situation? Well, I don't know because I don't know your customers and I don't know the exact domain that you're in. Maybe it's different in a retail store than it is in e-commerce. Maybe it's different in a distribution center. You need to have that conversation. And in fact, in this example, maybe the ubiquitous language conversation needs to be around what is the definition of quantity versus container size? What is the definition of size code? Whatever you decide on, everything from your UI to your code to your documentation needs to reflect that ubiquitous language. When I was preparing this, um, this presentation, I was asked to put in something about how do we have the ubiquitous language conversation. So unfortunately, there is no silver bullet for this. You're going to have to talk to people. You're probably going to have to draw, I know Joe's shaking his head, you're probably going to have to draw some pictures and look at some diagrams. Maybe there's pre-existing ones you can refer to and say, is it, is it called this? Is, you know, this number on the check, what's it called? Oh, well, it used to be called an ABA number, but now it's a routing transit number. There are some other techniques we can use, and I don't have time to go into them now, but if there's interest, give that feedback, and maybe that can be another talk. But you know, I'm a big believer in specification by example, which is sort of the groundwork under behavior-driven development. And I just heard a talk from a guy named James Grenning, who had this clever acronym of zombies, and if you ask me nicely, I'll tell you what it stands for. But the point is, you have to have a conversation with people. The ubiquitous language has the word language in it, and that's no accident. So what did we learn here today? We definitely learned a word we can impress people with at cocktail parties. I gave you an exceptional book recommendation. And we learned that ubiquitous language prevents confusion, only if you actually use it, of course. I gave you a little bit of a hint about domain-driven design and some of the pros that it can have over more of a XML-centric design or a technology-centric design. And the not-so-secret theme of every talk that I have given and will give is that you need to communicate. You need to talk to people. There is no silver bullet. bullet. There's only our ability to use language and hopefully make it ubiquitous. Thank you. Question. What is zombies? All right, I'm being asked nicely, what does zombies stand for? So according to James Grenning, this is a technique you can use in test-driven development, or you could potentially also use it in a conversation. The ZOM, you probably know, that's zero, one, and many. The B is your boundary behaviors, I is interface definition, E is exceptional scenarios, and S is the scenarios themselves. So this is to remind you to think about these things when you work out how something should behave and what its function should be. In, in the actual slides, I meant to say this before, so in the actual notes to these slides, which Joe, you're going to send these out, um, I put a whole bunch of URLs so you can go read the article where he talks about that, and you can read other articles about these other topics. All right. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.